Join award-winning author and founder of the Regenetics Method, Sol Luckman, as he shares with us the secrets to conscious healing. In this episode, Sol explains how we are currently moving into the third era of medicine, how to change our bioenergy blueprint to heal, and the power of subtle energy fields of sound and light to potentiate our DNA. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our show as we continue on with our series on energy, frequency, vibration, and magnetics, the next era of healthcare. As you know, we often run series. They usually go for around 10 to 15 episodes, and we just really completely round the topic out. And so this is another episode today that I think is just phenomenal. Every episode we've done so far in the series has just been so much fun and I think so incredibly informative. Now, a couple of fun things that we got going on that I will share more with you as information comes in and I am allowed to, but we are actually in the process of doing a short little filming on pesticides and mycotoxins or mold toxins. So if you're not familiar with that, definitely a big area to look into and something to be very aware of. We're specifically doing a little piece on that around coffee and mold exposure and pesticides. So it was a really big deal. If you really enjoy coffee and you like coffee, if you haven't had the experience of trying mycotoxin-free coffee versus regular coffee, you need to try it and just see if you notice a difference. I know for myself, when I first did it, um, the jitteriness that I would get from coffee was totally different. There was a different aspect of clarity that I would get when I would have mycotoxin-free coffee versus regular coffee. And some regular coffee can be not too bad. Some are better than others. But if you get some that does have a lot of mold in it, for example, then you can definitely notice a big difference. So I would say try it and see for yourself what it, what it feels like. Some of the big things when we talk about mycotoxins or things like aflatoxin B1, right? That's also known as a powerful carcinogen and that can be found in coffee. That's one of the mold toxins that can be found in coffee. Another one called ocratochin or ocratoxin A. This is also one that can actually affect dopamine levels in the brain. It can deplete them, right? It can have effects on mood and behavior and even be responsible for a certain amount of cell death in the brain. So it's a big deal to decrease your exposure wherever you can from anything that has to do with pesticides and mold exposure. So check out the Ascent Nutrition Coffee. Check out the link below. Click the link. It'll give you 10% off your order. But uh, go and check them out. Ascent is a really integrous company. And they actually have partnerships with these local farms in Guatemala that are organic. And they test everything for mycotoxins. And they're actually primarily owned by female farmers, which I think is really cool. So awesome company. Go check them out. And they've got an array of different products. But uh, they have a really awesome mold and mycotoxin and pesticide free coffee. So check that out. The other thing that if you haven't had a chance to check out is go and look at C60 from Purple Power. Um, that is on the top of my list of things to do to just minimize all cause illness or to build resilience over time to almost any chronic illness. It's one of my favorite supplements at the moment. And you only need to take about a teaspoon a day, very little. It's a pretty powerhouse antioxidant. It works on trying to minimize and as much as it can around oxidative load, it tries to assist and optimize mitochondrial function. And in today's world right now, with everybody concerned about immune system and how do I build resilience to try and minimize my capacity for illness and optimize my overall wellness, C60 would be at the top of my list. Check out the link below and they will give you 15% off your order. So in today's episode, we talked to Sol Luckman and, you know, Sol had reached out to me a while back, actually about his new book called Cali the Destroyer. And we were going to talk about that. But when I started to look through his information, he had done a ton of cool work on really bridging the science and the metaphysics and that some of the traditional wisdom that's gone on. A lot of the actual experts that you're going to hear throughout this series do a beautiful job of doing that. But Soul's book, Conscious Healing and Potentiate Your DNA, really dove into that. So I wrote back to him, I said, you know, Soul, you'd be perfect guest for this episode in this series. So we're talking all about energy, frequency, vibration, and specifically around potentiating DNA, 
we talk about the three different eras of medicine and how we are currently moving into this third era of medicine, which he talks about as metagenetics. And this is this non-local type of medicine, an incredibly powerful time uh, to be alive, really, to be a part of where we are moving into medicine. So we get into that. We talk about the importance of DNA as an antenna that literally is receiving information from light and sound and playing a role in potentiating our DNA. We talk about how to access literally miracles in our lives simply by fully moving into our body and having a very embodied experience and the power of that. We look at insights around a holographic reality and what that means when we talk about it from a perspective of body, health, and even reality as itself. We have a really fun conversation and I'm sure Soul and I and Tay will probably be doing more work in the future because it was such a, a fun, easy conversation to go back and forth. Soul is a wealth of information. So um, get your notepad out and start taking some notes, check out his books and uh, let me know if you have any questions. We are super excited to present this material to you guys. All right, enjoy and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Inspire Health Podcast. And we continue on with our series on energy, frequency, vibration, magnetics, the next era of healthcare. And today we're bringing Sol Luckman. And Sol is a longtime researcher of shamanism and spirituality. Sol is an iconoclastic psychonaut devoted to exploring and exposing the truth about human history and potential. Sol is the critically acclaimed author of several books, including Conscious Healing and Potentiate Your DNA, where he examines the critical role played by DNA and consciousness in healing and transformation. He is also the founder of his own unique form of sound healing called the Regenetics Method. His new novel, Kelly the Destroyer, was the finalist in both the New Age and Visionary categories of the 2021 International Book Awards. So welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I, I've enjoyed chatting a little bit already, so uh, I feel warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, we've had actually a blast with this series so far. Everybody we've gotten to speak with has just been a wonderful conversation. And even already, it feels like we meet our long lost brothers and sisters in a lot of ways. So um, it's, it's great to actually get to connect with you, Saul. Likewise, I kind of feel like we're all in some kind of strange uh, COVID resistance college <laughs> where, you know, one of these days we'll have a reunion and we'll look back on what we did to to defeat the bad guys and move forward. That's definitely I, what it feels like. Yeah, it yeah. totally does. I think that's why everybody connects so fast. But uh, I look forward to that reunion. So we'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll figure out a really fun place where we can all get together with our kids. So. Yeah, so Mexico would be good. There we go. There we go. We'll find a spot for us. So when Soul sent me this book, Conscious Healing, this was fascinating. And I read that and then I started to go through the Potentiate Your DNA. So one of the things I love about the book that you did is you did a phenomenal job with juxtaposing the science as well as the art, or I would say like the intuitive um, metaphysical aspects of health in order to really bring support to the theories and the different concepts that you talk about in the book. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I've sometimes uh, quipped that the book could have been called textual healing. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm really trying to bridge art and science or spirituality and, and more left brain concepts. Yeah, I, I think it's actually essential because the, the science, I mean, and I've been in this world for a while and I mean, I've interviewed people specifically that know how to evaluate science and have seen how deceptive science can be. And so there's an aspect of science that's incredibly valuable, but I think you still need to bridge it with this other part. And when you, when you bring in the metaphysical part of it, and, and even I would put in like eclectic knowledge and indigenous information, clinical experience, all of these different things, it really adds flavor and texture to the whole conversation. So, you know, I tried to do a similar thing when I did the science mysticism and beyond. We tried to bring in scientists and we tried to bring in clairvoyance and we tried to bring in shamans and basically just bring in different perspectives because you actually find a lot of people saying the same type of message, but just using very different ways of doing it. Well, that was what I concluded exactly over the course of, of my research and the, the development of this work. Uh, this notion that that 
the there are these universal truths that have to do with the nature of reality and the, and our relationship to it and people have have described that variously over the millennia but they're getting at the same thing for example you read a book like uh jeremy narby's the cosmic serpent and he's describing these ayahuasca shamans in the amazon who are seeing serpents in their visions and Narby realizes they're actually seeing and communicating with DNA. Yet, yet this technology, and I use that in quotes, this ancient technology came about long before the, the, the modern discovery of DNA. I believe that civilization goes back well beyond what's been recorded and that there were prior eras where people would have known very much what DNA is and what it does. But for the purposes of having a more mainstream viewpoint here, we can just say these shamans a thousand years ago in this lineage were doing this, seeing DNA, interacting with it, and creating a language that they understood and that their people could understand, and that had to do with snakes, snakes and serpents. Hmm. Well, and then, you know, we talked to Dr. Todd Ovocatus a while back, and we've had him on several times because I just love him. We just think he's, he's amazing. And um, so well informed and so bridges the the two different worlds of science and spirituality. But he came to the same awareness too, and he had an experience where he actually communicated with the consciousness of DNA, and that's what opened up the door for him to even create what was now, what's now known as pineal tones. So it's all really fascinating. I think there's this what's coming up right now, which I find really. Um, really important and really fascinating is just all of this information that's surfacing around DNA that's been going on, I think, for a long time. I mean, you pull up research from quite a while back, but I feel like it's really coming to the forefront right now. And it seems like we're at a place in consciousness right now in humanity where, where there's, this is a big deal. There's a lot going on around this. Absolutely. For me, it's where the rubber meets the road. It's where, it's where you can create really meaningful change and healing is by interacting with DNA. And that can be done using consciousness and energy and not necessarily through gene splicing or other DNA altering technologies like certain jabs these days. Yeah, I, I think it's really fascinating. And it's, um, you know, it's the other day we were talking to RJ Spina and in an episode around this, and he was talking about, which ties into some of the information you mentioned in your book too, but was basically saying that source directly connects with DNA and RNA and provides information for it. And I just said, there's something about that that just feels so settling to know that I can have a connection with source and that information can actually influence and speak with my own DNA rather than it coming from outside sources. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, for me, you have to define what source is. I see, I see, uh... I see source, when people use that term, I think sometimes they mean one thing and sometimes they mean another thing. I believe that we live in a reciprocal reality that was described very well by Dewey Larson and his uh, reciprocal uh, theory. Of, it was a physical system of a reciprocal system of physical theory, I think was the name of his, his, whole, his whole spiel. And we live in space time and there's an energetic obverse reality called time space and we receive information constantly from time space we're totally constantly in dialogue with it and some people would describe that as source but there's also a greater consciousness that is outside of both of those that informs both space time and time space and that is source with a capital s mm -hmm. yeah i would say we're probably talking about the same thing just uh maybe different terminology. And, and part of that you'll hear even throughout this entire series, you'll hear people using sometimes different language, but often we're still talking about something fairly similar. Yes, this yes. Is, this is a good time, Sol, to maybe break down a few terminology for people that I think are important to talk about. So some of the ones I'd like to break down would be what the meaning is or what your perception of things like energy, frequency, vibration, light consciousness enlightenment i know that could probably be a conversation all on its own but maybe i'll pass them back to you to just give a bit of an overview of those different concepts maybe starting with energy then frequency then vibration 
Yeah, you know, I don't really separate them that much. I think that on any any um, the frequency, energy, vibration, depending on where you catch them in their circuit, that it's all part of the same phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So uh, as we're interacting with time space, you might have something that that uh, starts out as like a torsion energy that enters our realm and it becomes an electromagnetic energy as it passes through DNA. And then as it inter interfaces with our molecular structure, you get vibration. But then our molecular structure goes right back around the circle and ends up tracking back into time space because we're reciprocally related to it. So the physical becomes energetic and the energetic becomes physical. It's the, it's the, it is the, the helix of our reality, if you will. And if you just twist it, that is our infinity, infinity circuit in a sense. It's the, it's the number eight. And uh, it's just how we, how we work. But again, informing all of that would be a, perhaps a, a, larger, a larger source with a capital S where things like energy, vibration, uh, and frequency actually don't exist. It's That's what gives rise to all of those things. So that would be God or the center of the galaxy or the creator, whatever you want to, you want to call it. So what this means is that everything starts out, you know, as some kind of energetic uh, reality, and then it, it passes through our DNA, uh, which is it all the DNA itself emerges from that energetic reality. So the DNA starts out as an energy and then it becomes some type of frequency like an electromagnetic event and or signal uh, because DNA is an antenna. And then that translates into vibration. And then you, what you end up with in, in measurable science would be your electromagnetic energy body, right? That, that's constantly communicating between the cells and telling, telling, uh, uh, organs, what to do, systems, what to do much faster than we could possibly explain through biochemical processes. Mm -hmm. And yet that's not to be confused with the bioenergy blueprint, which is the pure energy blueprint that is, that is in time space in our, in our reciprocal reality, which is, which is really what's called ca causing the shots. So the, if you want to create changes here that are permanent, it's my observation and opinion that you need to go over and change the blueprint in time space. So when you do that, then the energy from time space will flow naturally as it does into space time and create permanent changes. So when you talk about the blueprint in time space, from a practical point of view, then what does that mean for people when we talk about changing that blueprint? Well, in, in both books, I provide schematics of our energy structure. And that is a, is a map of the blueprint because the blueprint is divided into a number of fields as that manifests into our, our, uh, our energy interface with time space, it becomes chakras and, and fields of, of sound, which are called auric fields. So there's your sound and light. And that's, that's a nine field structure to start with. It can be modified to an eight field structure, which happens during the regenetics process. So you start out with your, your bioenergy blueprint that then governs the, the, the activity, the electromagnetic activity of the energy body in space time. Okay. So when you see pictures like, uh, you know, this huge toroidal structure of the heart energy putting out, you know, massive, you know, massive wings, that's almost angelic. Those images are so beautiful of, of energy, you know, heart math research and all of that. Really, that's part of the energy body here in space time, but it's governed by the bioenergy blueprint in time space. Now, here's a real mind blower for you. Because they're reciprocally related, that means that a version of ourselves is over in time space experiencing reality <laughs> and everything gets reversed. <laughs> so that our, our energy body here becomes their blueprint. When you start to get in, when you start to really open up the door into thinking along these lines, 
it, it really does flip almost everything you know upside down a little bit. Oh, it is a trip. I wrote about this subject, uh, this, this um, doppelganger or twin, twinning uh, subject is uh, the backbone of my last novel, Snooze, A Story of Awakening. And it's about this kid who, he, his mother dies in ch childbirth. He's born with a call and he's super gifted and he's able to travel into time space and change reality by doing so. It's, it's kind of fascinating because as much as this stuff seems kind of hard to wrap your head around in a conversation like this, it's like go and watch a lot of the, even the, I mean, gosh, look at a lot of the superhero movies that come out now. It's like, these are, these are common concepts in a lot of those movies. They're accepted because in those, in those venues, they're considered to be fictional. But, but we know that the, the powers that be, that soon may not be, let's hope, are always sending signals through, it's, it's, it's hiding things in plain sight, it's putting out information for plausible deniability, it's putting out information to create these kind of fake contracts through our quote unquote consent that we never really gave. And so they're, they're obligated in some sense to tell the truth, even in a twisted fashion. And I believe they believe that that's that this will this will allow them to escape karmic repercussions for their actions. And I think they're wrong. Well, and when you become aware of it, you you actually start to see it everywhere. Oh yes, it's everywhere in every discipline, every single discipline. And this is what I've something that I've heard of um, quite a few times. These especially these past, I would say, a year and a half to two years since we've been more open to it and we've been looking at it um, is what you just said with regards to these forces do need to um, have our permission and so one way this is even granted is you know having it within movies or in shows or in programs and and this hasn't been in an accident it has all been intentional as far as almost as if by them exposing themselves in that way, um, there is permission granted on our part, though not directly, but in a sense, if we're watching it and if we're cheering it on and if we're being exposed to the agendas and the plans that has been, just as you described, a way for them to execute, um, execute their plans. Yeah, it's almost like silence is consent. Right. You know, if, if we don't, if we don't object, if we don't stand up, then we deserve what we get. And there is actually some truth to that, that people need to ponder. We need massive civil disobedience across the entire world. Yeah, that's kind of where we are right now. It's, you know, we've talked about this before, that if you are acting in ways that are in misalignment with what your gut instincts and heart wisdom tell you we need to be able to stop and rethink that and get back in alignment and act from those places yeah i like that word alignment that that, that feels right that's that's yeah. uh that's the, that's a really good way of, of putting it well and on, from another level of that i find like that's ultimately at the heart of almost all disease too i i think that when people are acting mm -hmm out of alignment. It's this disconnect. This is this brain or mind body disconnect that we talk about in many ways. I think we are living in a way that is out of alignment with the core of who we are, with the connection, like I said, to gut wisdom, our gut instincts and heart wisdom. However, we want to articulate that in whatever words we want to use. But when we are, when we are functioning in our lives in that disconnect, I just think that is going to breed disharmony in the body. Yes, disease. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's an easy one to actually see if you can get back in the body and connect with feeling sense and what's going on in your body and approach it with a willingness and an honesty to be able to look at it. Yeah, I would say that, that out of body experience is what most people are having. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> they just don't know it. A whole different twist on that. Exactly. So, so I want to go back to the DNA because one of the things that you mentioned specifically was around DNA being an antenna. There's an electromagnetic field connected to DNA. I'm thinking maybe we can talk about that a little bit because 
from most people's perspective, DNA is this little thing in the body that kind of sets the stage for our genetics. And that's kind of what it does. You know, we've been told 95% of our DNA is more or less junk DNA and about 5% is what we use. Can you talk a little bit around that concept with DNA, even from the junk DNA, what that actually is potentially, how DNA acts like an antenna and what it means to even have an electromagnetic field connected with DNA and how that influences us? Yeah, yeah, those are great questions. Uh, The first thing I would say is that uh, ever since the advent of of epigenetics, the work of Bruce Lipton and some other really, really uh, brilliant people, Elizabeth Sartoris comes to mind, a fantastic mind. Basically, the top-down model of the brain being in 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 the nucleus this idea that DNA is controls our destiny, genes as destiny, all of these related concepts have pretty much been shown to be bunk. And more and more scientists are admitting this. They're also finding all kinds of activity in this junk DNA that they are having a difficult time explaining. Like what, why is it doing the things that it is doing, even though it's not coding in the way that a certain small percentage of our DNA is. And, you know, I've seen numbers range from two to 5% in terms of, you know, what you're looking at in terms of coding DNA and things that actually build proteins and all of that. So in the epigenetics, it's very clear that the brain is actually in the cell membrane. So that's a good mnemonic. And so it's these proteins that are in the cell membrane and they, and these proteins react with the environment and that includes the electromagnetic environment so you know things like these cell towers are very troubling from an epigenetic perspective because they could have a very deleterious effect just as positive energy can have an extremely healthful impact so the science of epigenetics is really the science of the way in which the environment interacts with our genetics and and in order to create positive and negative genetic changes. So a beautiful song and in a a healthy key, and there's a whole discussion we could have about, about music, but a beautiful tune might cause your, some of your genes that don't need to be on to switch off. And maybe those are the cancer causing genes. And then this has nothing to do with your DNA. Really, it has to do with the environment. Now, the DNA ultimately is instructed what to do by the brain in the membrane, but the interaction is an environmental interaction. Now, this is the science of epigenetics. Now, I explored something that I believe is beyond epigenetics, and I called it metagenetics. Now, I'd, I'd like to just backtrack half a second and talk about three eras of medicine. We can look at this from a sort of a historical perspective. And this is, uh, I've got a a shout out to Dr. Larry Dossey. He wrote uh, uh, several books uh, that I absolutely love about the power of prayer and sound and words to heal people. One of them was called uh, Healing Words, I believe. He he outlined three eras in medicine that just goes this uh, this model goes so far towards explaining what we've seen what we're seeing and what we're about to see he started with era one he called it uh, it was for him it was basically the era of traditional allopathic medicine the medicine that sees the body as a machine a mechanism, something, you know, that you can cut and slash and burn and cure that way. So you can just think about all of the medical quote unquote treatments that have emerged from that way of looking at the human being as basically a meat sack. Era two is where you go from the kind of genetic model and the physical model into, and I, and I did some, some things here to elaborate on, on Dossie's model. But you go from era one to era two, and in era two, you go into mind-body. And it's the relationship between our mental state, our thoughts, and our bodily experience. This is also the era of epigenetics. And I would say it's the era of light, where light is examined for healing purposes. And it's a, it, light is sort of a quintessential electromagnetic frequency. 
and people and it's visible and and it's very there <laughs> in a way that maybe other things aren't as there for uh, sound is more esoteric in some ways you if you can't see it it's a little it's a little closer to being an etheric energy when you move into era three i called it metagenetics and it's non-local medicine medicine that transcends your local experience it transcends your own thoughts your own power of positive thinking and all of that and gets into your relationship with source with inspiration i included in this this era three the notion of the power of positive feeling where the body is actually actualized in a certain way and this goes right down into the dna to generate extraordinary healing and transformational potential now yeah. the idea behind metagenetics is that you can utilize energy and that and specifically the energy of sound beyond going beyond light to stimulate the dna which is a an antenna that is constantly receiving and emitting sound and light signals it stimulates the dna when you use sound in a certain way when it's linguistically encoded in a certain way and you can look up the science of wave genetics and vladimir paponin and peter garayev and other people who have done work in this area when you stimulate dna using sound that's linguistically encoded you can change the blueprint over in time space you can change it so dramatically that you can actually alter species in their in utero or in the cells before they're they're hatched or born so that's pretty wild uh, in some some of these experiments you had you had uh like a salamander embryo that was exposed to these linguistically encoded sound frequencies and out pops a frog when the egg hatches yeah i i was i was reading some of those studies too so and it's it's fascinating i mean it's it's actually amazing and and this idea of this blueprint i mean I, and I totally agree with you. I think this is definitely where we're moving is this third era. You know, there was definitely a big push on mind body and mind body is still really important, but it, like you said, it, it goes beyond that. And I think particularly when you said there's definitely got to be a movement from positive thinking to positive feeling. It's, um, it's really an embodiment of things as opposed to a, a thinking construct. We need to get back in the body in, in a very significant way which I think connects with the feelings, like you said, inspiration, connection to source, and literally feeling it in the body. Everything changes when you actually feel it. Um, you know, otherwise, I think it actually potentiates the disconnect that's going on when we're trying to think something, but we're not honoring what the body's actually feeling. I actually think a lot of times it creates more ill health and re sticks us almost into some of the patterns that we're in because we're not actually being authentic within ourselves yeah that that resonates with me it's it's really strange that era one has this medicine that's all about the body but that is where people are most disconnected from their body and that's where they have that's that was the advent of the cancer epidemic that was the advent of autoimmune illnesses that was when it all exploded and of course there were many other factors besides just that disconnect going on all of the, the the medical procedures and you know the the multiplying jabs from birth forward uh you know we, we could talk about the dental mercury and all kinds of things that were very problematic so if if you can just follow uh, follow this line of thinking with me for just a second you start out totally disconnected and then the first step back into your body is to think about the connection between your mind and your body your your energy field but you're not really there yet you're still it's like training wheels for moving into your body fully and when you move into your body and you really start to feel it miracles can happen absolute miracles and not just miracles in terms of health but miracles in terms of your life path your career opportunities openings that in, in impossible situations that seem just like they should never have happened yet they did mm -hmm. well and you open yourself up to information coming in a different way it doesn't have to be this thinking linear fashion that we've grown accustomed to it can be information that 
comes in in, in multidimensional ways and insights and knowings that are completely different process than going through the thinking mind. So you, you allow yourself to open into a field where information can, can arrive in a very different way for you. Oh, that's really true. I was watching, um, was re-watching uh, the Half-Blood Prince recently. The Harry Potter. I'm, Harry I'm not Potter sure if you're familiar series, yeah. with that. Did, did you ever watch that? Oh, one? I, I was when those came out. I was a big fan of the. I hammered through those books and and then watched the movies. Yeah, I I I, I always enjoy watching all of those. So so there is a part of that movie that is 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 very uh, is a very good example of what we're discussing here, where Harry finally takes the the good luck potion, right? And he's going to try to get this professor to. Dive the information that he has about the Dark Lord that's really important for them to be able to defeat him. And Harry and his friends, Hermione and Ron, had planned to, to do it in a certain way, and they had it all laid out. And Harry instead takes off down to his friend Hagrid's hut. And they're like, where are you going? What are you doing? We have a plan. He's like, don't, don't worry about it. I, I just feel that's the right place to be. <laughs> and he goes, and it works out, and it happens. Yeah. You know, during even um, our uh, many of our discussions in the Science, Mysticism, and Beyond series was what was reiterated over and over again is that this time that we're currently in, this, this time that has been prophesized by many ancient cultures and the indigenous, um, there's actually this heightened awareness that we are all now blessed with, where we have much greater sensitivity to actually what's going on around us. And that's not an accident. So things that we might have not thought too much about were, were now being deeply affected by. And, you know, I'm thinking of certain things that kind of stick out in my memory these past in, these past few years, like cell towers in our kids' schoolyard. Um, or um, as far as the excess of sugars or ingredients that we can't even read um, on the back of our, you know, the, the processed foods that we commonly buy and oftentimes um, eat ourselves and pass on to our children, or just, just a lot of things that we could have, you know, shrug our shoulders or thought not a big deal, but we're, we're noticing more on an intuitive level that, hey, that's, there's something wrong with that, or that's not right, or why is that happening, or why, is it, why are things set up that way? And I think these are all, even when you're speaking of um, music, like I know personally, I haven't been able to listen to music on, on mainstream music for a very long time now. And even now, where, where we are currently in Mexico, <laughs> <laughs> we're kind of in party central and Saturday nights in particularly. <laughs> That's but, a lot of boom, chicka, boom, chicka, boom, chicka. Yeah, and it's, <laughs> Sounds like Playa del Carmen to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's really jarring for the nervous system. And, um, and I think what it brings to light is that the, what we are currently and have been for a long time surrounded by and inundated with is just not for the good of humanity. Yeah, I agree, Matt. Not at all. I mean, it's it's a it's a, a kind of a minefield. I mean, everything out there is somehow designed to harm us, either either physically or or emotionally, intellectually. We're we're dumbed down in our curricula. We're you know, like you said, we're getting all of this this crap and our foods our, our music is is not in any way uplifting the really funny thing that i'm seeing right now is of all people to kind of burst the dam of of this mainstream celebrity denial of the on the genocide that's happening was Nicki minaj mm. yeah and now you have all these NBA players coming out and saying they're not, you know, they're not getting the jab and, and it's, it's beginning to cascade. And I think this is just the beginning of, of that process where, like you were saying, the, the, uh, the beginning of uh, what you had to say a moment ago, Taya, this idea that there's a higher, I don't know, a greater frequency or more, more availability of information for people to tune into. 
these people are starting to tune into it. And when enough of them do with their followings, I think the deep state has one, one of two choices. I mean, either they can completely shut down the internet <laughs> or they can be destroyed. Yeah, so what's the date today that we're recording this? I think it's October 4th. 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 And uh, just today, we were talking about this briefly before we started recording. Um, just today, Facebook went down, Instagram went down, WhatsApp went down, and I'm not sure what else you're seeing, Sol, but I know those three, we were able like to- all over the world. Confirm yeah. that, yeah, lots of our contacts around the world have confirmed that those three have gone down. Yeah, I was I was mentioning um, the the zero hedge article, which uh, was really fascinating. And the, the headline is um, for this for this phenomenon that you're discussing Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp down worldwide after DNS records vanish employees, employees badges reportedly not working. And the little tagline is one day ahead of whistleblower testimony. <laughs> So yeah, what's going on with that? Yeah, really, who needs to watch movies when we live real life reality in 2021? <laughs> yeah, I'm living on popcorn these days, pretty much. <laughs> uh, so when you were getting back to, well, I want to touch one more thing back about the blueprint because this idea was even, I remember listening to like Rupert Sheldrake long time back. And he would talk about morphogenic fields. In a lot of ways, I think about these morphogenic fields as being the blueprint to the cell. So which supersedes the physical that we tend to, in, in mainstream medicine, we tend to just address that physical primarily. But this is sort of the field above that where all of these different things actually affect the blueprint of the cell. So if that is out of balance, if that blueprint is faulty, you will keep constructing the same physical cell over and over and over again to until that blueprint gets corrected or optimized or upgraded or whatever it is, then you will start to have a different physical reality. And so that can tie into lots of things that can tie into directly like mental emotions. It ties into with the systems of the, vi the vital body, like the chakra system and the acupuncture meridians and all of these different pieces too. A lot of which you go into great detail with in your book as, as well, when you start to break down the different fields. But I think what's important to remember is these different fields, and, and this goes back into lots of stuff tied around Ayurvedic medicine and Chinese medicine. It's like these different areas relate to a much broader concept of health. They, they tie in different organ systems that are related to them, that ties in different emotions that are related to them and different ways of thinking. And it, it goes well beyond just looking at things from just a purely physical way. Yeah, it's all holographic too, you know? I mean, there's a Japanese system of acupuncture where they only work in the ear. And so that is a tiny microcosm of the rest of the, of the body. And, and so it's really amazing to think that all of these acupuncture points, the meridians, the, 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 uh, you know, the, the nadis and the, and the Vedic uh, tradition, the chakras, the auric fields, they're all parts of the energy the energy apparatus. Uh, they're either in the electromagnetic realm, uh, it, you know, if they can be measured and chakras actually have been measured. Motoyama's work uh, shows that they've actually been measured or, or they're solidly over in the, the, or not so solidly over in the etheric realm of, of time space. Sheldrake is spot on. In fact, when you, when you read uh, Sheldrake, or at least people commenting on Sheldrake's work, I would have to verify if he uses this terminology in his books. It's been a while since I've read them, but there's two, two words. One is morphic and the other one is morphogenic. And it strikes me that morphogenic is a word that is applied to biological organisms and to their bioenergy blueprint in time space. Now that, that's not exactly how he would say it, but I believe he's talking about exactly that phenomenon that I was discussing earlier, but other things have their own fields too rocks, uh, uh, cars, houses, everything has a morphic feel that has a blueprint because we live in a holographic reality. So there is an actual projector of this reality and it is in time space. So all of these morphic and morphogenic fields are constantly projecting what we perceive as reality. But really it's all a big hologram. 
This, um, this reminds me of actually a story that Greg Braden spoke about um, during one of the retreats that we attended a few years ago, where, and, and if, you're, if you're sensitive to, if you're a vegetarian or a vegan and you're sensitive to this information that might come out in a, in a moment, um, please maybe mute this part. But he was actually talking about within the shamanic community, when somebody is quite ill, um, they go to the, the main shaman within that community and the shaman actually brings in a guinea pig and they place the guinea pig on the body of uh, the individual who is really sick. And, and what they actually do is they run the guinea pig up and down the body and um, within this ritual or prayer or ceremony and afterward um, they actually tear apart the guinea pig and inside the body of the guinea pig will be exposed the part within the human body that is ill and needing uh, the attention do you remember yeah. Greg Braden speaking of that yeah 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 I've actually heard of something similar to that I wonder if it's the same tradition that's interesting it's fascinating and and it would work based on the principles that we've been talking about. Right. Well, a lot of the principles that we're talking about are, are in some way used in a lot of those types of traditions for a long time. I think we're just getting to a place where we can explain them in a way that, um, or validate them in a way that, uh, that the mind likes to understand them. I think we're, we're learning to see through our education. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of Nicely us have said. been have been enough uh, have gone through enough of the conventional medicine um, and wholeheartedly disappointed in lots of ways. And now we're looking for other avenues uh, for true healing. Yes, you know, I've, I've often said that if I'm if I'm in an accident and I need emergency brain surgery, I don't want an electrician working on me right? I want, I want help. But for most things, doctors are not necessary. And I'm sorry, uh, it's just the, I mean, I'm, I mean, the allopathic doctors with, with pharmaceuticals and, and, and surgery. For most things, they simply are a relic that will go away or transform into something else. Well, and how I think of it is ultimately, um, if we're living, it's almost like I was, Tana and I were having this conversation a while back, and it's almost like where a lot of people have gotten themselves into because of such a long, such a long history of just either doing all of the things that are creating a lot of chronic illness, being exposed to certain things, eating a certain way, um, not, man not managing emotions, all, a lot of different pieces of it. And then they're life. in such a, a deep state of chronic illness that then they almost become reliant on the, the pharmaceutical industry and stuff to try and give some type of relief if, if they get any from that. And right. can even be dangerous to take them off of things directly, right? That's not what we're advocating because you can be in a place where then you, you almost have become dependent on certain things. But in, in a broader reality, many things are... I mean, the body is capable of restoring itself from almost everything. And like you said, for sure, if you have a car accident, then there's, thank God we've got the technology and the, the foresight of where medicine's gone to be able to deal with acute injuries like that. But the vast majority of chronic injuries yes, yes, is yes. not the forte for allopathic medicine. It's just not. It's the, in most of that stuff is very much lifestyle based. And so if we manage that kind of stuff and decrease the impact and the load on the body, to me, health and resilience is a natural part of being human. Yes. Spot on. And I think, you know, there's, there's all of these different ways of, uh, of looking at uh, the notion of self-care, starting with what you eat, uh, maybe not even starting with, but for the purposes of this discussion, you know, what you put in your body, do you get rest? Do you get exercise? Do you get sunlight at the right time of day? Then beyond that, where, where are your thought processes? What, what are you doing with your mind? How are you interacting epigenetically with your environment? As, especially as you get older, are you, uh, are you working with your neuroplasticity? Are you learning new things? Are you keeping your mind young? And then moving beyond that into the embodiment part, part of the discussion, 
where, how are you feeling about things? What are you doing to truly transform yourself? And, and are you open to greater possibilities of connection with source? Yeah, yeah, I love it. I think that's, that kind of encapsulates um, optimal healing, optimal wellness, optimal life. If you can incorporate those things, and, and at the forefront of that, I think there's this, this feeling inside of being connected. There's this feeling inside of being connected, of being inspired, and there's a constant sense of meaning. You know, your life is meaningful. And when our life is meaningful, then those are sort of natural sequelae to everything. Yes, uh, you know, and really the, the, the greatest remedy of them all is just very simple, surfing. Mm. Just surf and you'll be, everything will be okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought at first you said searching and I'm like, oh, like curiosity. I'm like, no, no, surfing. Surf. <laughs> Fair enough. That'll just steal everything and put you in the moment. So, <laughs> well, I say that somewhat tongue in cheek, but but it's true too. There are doctors in France, for example, who prescribe surfing to patients with arthritis and all kinds of things. And the results have been wild. One of the things that surfing does is it puts you in that kid's mind where you're just very in the present. And I don't know if it makes life meaningful or meaningless in that moment, but it doesn't matter. It's just so alive, the whole experience. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. I'm going to start prescribing that. Although I got to live somewhere where I can prescribe that. So, hey, you can work on that. I, I can, I can work on that. So, I wanted to ask you because I know a lot of, of our audiences who will be watching this from YouTube are going to be asking about um, your eyeglasses right now. <laughs> tell us, tell us about the fact that we're not able to see you directly, and the fact that we have a painting of you on YouTube. Well, I am a painter and that's, that is a self portrait. So that's uh, a piece of information. Let's see where to start in this age where you're tracked and every, every time you log on where our privacy has disappeared. You know, when I started out uh, on this public path, uh, you know, nearly two decades ago now, I, I chose to, to do it this way. And I'm really, really glad that I did. Yeah. Let's just put it that way. Also, I'm an author. And so uh, there's a long tradition of being anonymous. J.D. Salinger is a good example. But really what swayed me to go in that direction was early on when we first, when Lee, my partner and I first started sharing regenetics with people and began training people in this work, they were treating me like I was some kind of messiah or guru. Like I had some special connection and that uh, this really amazing work that was so powerful had come through me and I was out there teaching it. And I was still, you know, I still had all of my warts and all, you know, I just felt like I was just a, a really normal person who had gone on a really difficult path where I almost died from injuries from, from jabs uh, and, and uh, spent a long long dark period uh trying to to get well and i was fortunately able to do that through this work but i did not like the feeling that that uh, this work was being made to be about me because i i felt like it was just just about the work and it should always be about the work and i and lee and i had a long discussion about this and we looked at privacy issues because we really saw forward into where the internet was going and we said, well, why don't we just do it this way and see how it works? And, and we thought, well, we can try that. And, and, you know, people may not like that or they may not respond to it, but let's just see how it works. And it's never really been a problem. And I'm really, I'm really happy I did that and that I can just be myself. I don't have to deal with, you know, I, I remember running into this happened years ago when we were living in Taos, New Mexico. And I was in a health food store and my son rounded a corner and just smacked into Julia Roberts. <laughs> and she, she was a mother at the time and she was very, very gracious and kind of sorted him out and sent him on his way or whatever. But I only knew it was her because I just did. I just looked into her face, but she was essentially incognito. She had like dreads and was in overalls. And I mean, you just would not have known who she was unless you were sort of a local and knew that she lived there and that kind of thing. And, you know, I just tracked this over to many conversations I've had with people who have gotten well known. And they're like, I so miss just being a nobody and being anonymous. That's the biggest thing that I miss. And 
I don't have to deal with that. Thank you. Nice. I think that makes a lot of sense. So one thing I wanted to go into too, and this, this, well, I'm curious to, to share your story as far as how you even, you know, your personal story that brought you to developing the regenetics method. Because most of the time we've got our own story as to, you know, we wanted to heal ourselves. And it's through that process that we then came across insights that we thought were valuable to share with other people. So could you tell us a little bit more about your story on how you came to this? Like, what were some of the things that, that you believe that caused some real significant ill health? Yeah, I, I, I detail this in much, in much, uh, many additional thoughts and, and conscious healing and potentiate your DNA. But in a, in a nutshell, I, I was in, I don't know if I was in good health, uh, necessarily, you know, how a lot of people, uh, when they're in their twenties, mm -hmm. they appear to be in good health and then they might break down. So it's possible I would have, I could have broken down, but I believe based on a lot of, a lot of testing, a lot of interacting with holistic doctors and, uh, naturopaths, other people, that, that what really broke me down was uh, getting jabs for travel. Uh, I, I, I was going down to Brazil to do dissertation research and within a relatively short period of time, I, I was just in a kind of catastrophic situation and I ha ultimately had to drop out of graduate school and search for solutions to my health. I had at least 30 symptoms, maybe more that I had I'd written down, including debilitating environmental and food allergies. I couldn't eat anything except uh, unseasoned meat and vegetables uh, for a very long period of time. I had lots of, lots, of, lots of symptoms in the fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue range, things that might be called autoimmune. And um, I also uh, had a lot of issues with the dental mercury, and I actually had a uh, some imp a pretty dramatic improvement after getting that replaced. But then, then it all came back. And what I think happened was that my body released a certain toxic load, and it it it's sort of normalization function kicked in for a period of time. And then, as I began detoxing more of the stuff out of my cells and and tissues. I went right back into the autoimmune stuff and it was really, really brutal. And um, so, yeah, I ended up uh, training with somebody who did allergy elimination technique. Her work was based on Nambudra pads work and Ellen Cutler's work. It wasn't, she wasn't calling it uh, Biosat or NAAT, but it was, it was based on that, those concepts. So we were using vials and we were doing, using the, the acupressure points to reset the, the essentially the nervous system's response to, to foods and substances, toxins, and that kind of thing. And I had experienced some benefits with that. That also kind of plateaued and I started losing ground as I was moving through my own healing process. And so I'm here, you know, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm offering this allergy elimination technique to, to people and I'm actually starting to lose ground again myself. And then I'm seeing this begin to happen with clients and I'm like, what's going on? And I, and I basically realized that we weren't essentially, we essentially, we weren't doing anything to the blueprint. Mm -hmm. We were using light, not sound to affect, to try to get at the, the malfunctions and light is usually just a temporary solution in my book. So I began exploring the notion of sound in relation to healing, in relation to DNA. I had a lot of extremely fortuitous encounters with people who, and teachers who gave me all kinds of information, books, you know, all kinds of things. I, down, I, I read voraciously. I downloaded all kinds of information. I had various wild mystical experiences. And I ended up with Lee going down back to Brazil, kind of the, the place where it all had started for me on a kind of, um, I don't know, last, you know, in a last ditch effort to, to heal myself, I said goodbye to my family, uh, thinking that I, I might really actually be saying goodbye in a permanent, in a permanent way. I was just not in good health at all. And I just felt like I could go at any time. I'd, I had lots of heart, uh, heart arrhythmias and other things, just things that were very, very troubling. And, um, so we, we, we went down there and had this, kind of a culminating experience where we encountered these lights floating out over the ocean. And I talk about this in Potentiate Your DNA and they literally shined into us and then boom, they were gone. And we felt really buzzed and very strange. 
we went back to our, our apartment where we were staying. This was on a, co on a coastal town in Brazil. And that night we both dreamed of these vowels. <laughs> and we had basically been given these codes that we were, we understood were to be thought and sung together. So you end up with two lines where you have a top line of vowels that you would be singing along. It might be I, A, I, something like that. And underneath that, in the same cadence, you would be thinking another line of vowels. Sometimes the vowels might line up and sometimes they might be different. Mm -hmm. So I make, you know, I make the joke and potentiate your DNA that you're, you're supposed to, to say one thing and think another, like a lot of people do. <laughs> <laughs> So not long after we, we did this, we, we performed this ceremony for ourselves, everything started to change. I began having a lot of detox and a lot of crazy stuff started coming out, but I began getting my foods back. I stopped having environmental sensitivities. I went through a little period of fatigue and then I reemerged and I started exercising again and I had greater and greater and greater levels of stamina. And this went on and on and on and on. And it's, it's gone on to this day. I keep getting stronger and I'm in my mid fifties now. I've put on, you know, probably about five pounds of muscle mass in the last year, just doing primal movement and surfing. Back to surfing again. Back to surfing. <laughs> <laughs> and primal movement while surfing. I've, I've, been exploring, <laughs> I've been exploring some very interesting riding techniques. Let's put it that way. I, I want to see that as a new e-course. <laughs> I'll work on it. <laughs> yeah, I just got this Hawaiian Paipo board that's just, just an amazing piece of work. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. One thing you said that I think is really important too, even though you're talking about thinking and, um, and saying something different, but it's actually incredibly important, mm -hmm. the connection between the thoughts or the intention and the sound together. A lot of times right we focus a lot on intention or sometimes people focus on just sound or just light, but, but there's a equation that you've talked about before too. Um, and that it is the, the intention and the sound together. And I think in your book, you talked about that even being related to how the shamans used to even do it and sort of connect in with the fault lines on the planet and whatnot. Yeah, there's, there's, there's uh, some information that they may have been sending information through the earth. Now, when I said that in the past, a lot of people in the esoteric field said, oh, that's evil, that's demonic energy. But then I started getting more into Gnosticism and thinking like, I, I don't know. I, you know, that's not how regenetics is done. I mean, I, I had all kinds of theories early on. I think, you know, as I learned more about uh, morphic resonance and, and, and uh, wave genetics and that kind of thing, it became very apparent that we're just in a sea of energy that we're interacting with all the time. But I think some shamans actually might have used the earth as a kind of uh, tra uh, uh, information transfer, uh, transport system or exchange. Yes. Well, I like the idea that sound can literally be the vehicle for intention to some point so that when we hold a certain intention and then we can add a specific sound or the right frequency to it, that that can literally be a vehicle to kind of drive that into creating some of the activation that, uh, within the DNA. Right, right. Uh, the, I, th I guess the formula you mentioned earlier was this idea that, that sound, uh, light is about information and sound is about transformation. Mm -hmm. So really light is, light is the, the directions, but you're not going to get there if you don't have a vehicle or the ability to at least walk. <laughs> so, or maybe in some instances crawl, but <laughs> um, you have to have both really to, to activate the, the, your full potential for healing and transformation. Right. And we're actually going to be within the series, going to be speaking with um, Lee Carroll, voice of Cryon, to really break down even the magnetic grid and what that has meant and how that has contributed to the, the healing of, of humanity and the earth, as well as the crystalline grid, Huna Flash. Uh, he's, a, he's a shaman and he'll speak specifically about that. That's kind of been his mission, his life's mission to um, go to different parts of the world and activate. Um, we'll get more into it. I think he needs to speak on this and I need to gain 
more clarity around it, but basically I think um, close down certain um, portals portals that are, have not been conducive to the health of humanity as well as the planet and reactivate or realign uh, to the great central sun um, portals that would be for the greatest good of all humanity as well as planet earth yeah well that's fascinating you know it's like when i i was writing this last book uh cali the destroyer it's about the, the the goddess and some of the plot revolves around the notion that you know the the, the planet is the actual body of the goddess mm. and she has her own chakra system her own energy points her own connections with galactic center which the gnostics called pleroma and that really is the great central sun mm. so it's a very yeah. interesting little connection there Right. So I, I think that's all really fascinating too, because it I mean it's it makes sense to me that the the planet itself does have its own consciousness and that it goes through a specific um shift in consciousness and that's going to affect everybody mm -hmm. else on the planet to some point, as well as everybody else on the planet that. affects mm -hmm. the consciousness of the planet. I mean, you actually seen that with the Heart Math Institute has done research where they've seen specifically that you know, shifts that are going on in and around our solar system will dramatically affect the heart coherence of the individuals on the planet. And at the same point, group collective changes in, con in um, heart rate variability of the individual will also affect that of the planet. So we very much have this very symbiotic relationship. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know if any studies have been done specific to the Schumann resonance and heart coherence, but I imagine there is a connection there. Yeah, it's an interesting one. We brought on Dr. Roland McCready from Heart Math Institute, and I was asking him specifically around some of the stuff with the Schumann resonance, but he was saying they've got the most sophisticated machines on the planet pretty much for measuring Schumann resonance. And he was saying that even though there's lots of talk about it changing significantly, he said from their research, he hasn't seen that change in the way that that we're hearing a lot of other people talk about it. And he said, ultimately, it goes, you don't want to see big changes in it because it would basically be devastating for the planet. But oh, that's interesting. Yeah, but he's definitely seen big changes that he's seen correlate between specifically heart rate variability of, of groups of large groups of individuals affecting um, changes on the planet. And, and also when you're seeing like solar flares and stuff like mm -hmm. that, it will correlate very directly with changes in individual heart coherence. So, you know, what I was thinking was a little more esoteric than that, because I was aware that the human resonance isn't shifting that much or, or the, and I also had heard that it could cause a lot of damage if it did shift a lot. Um, but I was thinking more along the lines of something like in the law of one, for example, where there's this idea that we're moving from third density to fourth density. And it's the, it's the, it's where we're, you know, this kind of person into a more of an ascended human with tremendous car, heart coherence, in which case you would, you would live on a different earth. And so the Schumann change would actually be part of the earth's transformation into a different environment to support this new type of human. Yeah, mm -hmm. that that I, I I would be totally in alignment with that. So I I think too, it's like a lot of times when when we're talking about lots of different stuff, there's this there's this talking about where we currently are or where the where the world is sort of you know three dimensional reality. But you know, as things transition, it's like everything could just be different. So it's it's almost like trying to take pieces of something that's in a three dimensional reality, and what would that look like in a four dimensional reality? And you can't you can't mix them until you're actually there. You you can't, and and I know people get in this mindset that well, look at where we are now, and how long it's going to take us to get there. But but I I invite people to think about how the butterfly must be feeling when it's going through its transformation. And the, this is taking forever, man. I mean, I just want to have those wings. I want to move on, you know, and yet viewed from the outside, it's an instant. It happens so fast. And you look at things like complex systems analysis, uh, chaos theory, and how, you know, you have this, you have this uh, pile of sand and it looks, like there it is, that's the way it's shaped and that's that. And one little grain of sand moves and the entire hill of sand changes shape and it's unrecognizable and it happens instantaneously owing to 
the movement of one grain of sand. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't even take that much if the if the timing is right, if the preparation has been done for there to be large scale transformation. And it doesn't even we don't even have to take that into ascension and enlightenment and all of that kind of thing that could simply be having a much better earthly civilization as we might currently understand it. Yeah, and it I, might very well be that the catalyst, the intense pressure, the the cauldron that we're in, this uh, crucible that we've been put in by the forces that are arrayed against uh, we the people, that that's exactly the conditions required for our collective healing and transformation. Yeah, I completely agree with that. So I've talked about that before and, and thought about the idea of like, you need this sort of pressure intense pressure to actually create the diamonds and um and that's ultimately what i think we're in right now it's this pressure that um ultimately can give way to creating that diamond yeah and then diamonds are forever <laughs> <laughs> nice well so can i can i go off the hinges a little bit here from your perspective so can you give us a bit of a status quo on where we're at where humanity is at currently how do you see it? What's your perspective? I've used the metaphor of awakening for a long time, and I'm, I'm going to stick with it because I think that's 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 the best one because we've been so profoundly asleep. Mm -hmm. I think there are levels to awakening, and there are people awakening, you know, on all different levels for all different reasons. Though some of those reasons are starting to come together now. I mean, there's there's the whole you know, anti-jab movement is uniting people in a way that possibly nothing outside of child abuse and pedophilia could, could do. Okay. And so, and that may be in the cards too, because there's a lot of that going on. So there's another, there's another thing that could come forward that could also unite the human family in a major way. But right now it's this jab and they're going to keep pushing it. And as they push, we're a little bit like children in relation to them because we're going to push back it's not going to work out well and most parents don't end up being able to control their children and i'm not saying they're our parents and i'm not saying that they're above us in that way i'm just saying there is a certain relationship between perceived authority and perceived subservience going on here and we're playing through this dynamic at the moment ultimately we're we're learning how to become you know there's that word that gets kicked around a lot sovereign we're learning how to become more empowered, embodied, all of that. That's part of what's happening. Let, let me finish with one more thing, because one thing that came up in the book and has come up actually a lot of times that ties in with activating the DNA is a, is a certain level of our state of consciousness to some point too. And a lot of conversation around the importance of surrendering fear to the torsion field of unconditional love. From your perspective, how does someone begin that process? What's how do we get to that place? I mean, I, I, I'm sure you've had your experiences with that. I know I've had experiences where I feel like I've, I've really been catapulted into that field for periods of time and it's transformational and it, and it then impacts really everything else that I, that I kind of do on an ongoing basis. But that's a, that's a big jump in the scale of consciousness to go from sort of fear up into there. How, how do you find to support people in that process? What's kind of required? surfing <laughs> now now i'm actually again i'm making a joke but i i want to i want to contextualize this the reason i say surfing is because it's this thing that is just a pure a purely joyful thing for most people they're not doing it for money it is just pleasure and so it, it pleasure and ex exploration it's connection with nature you're also connecting with waves which is like connecting with energy so in a sense you're connecting to source and you're certainly connecting to that aquatic maternal nature of the planet and to our, our our great mother and so these are really important pieces but you can have all of those things following your bliss in whatever direction that might be so i always say follow your bliss and then start making your decisions from that state of mind and make your decisions Make him other important decisions like what healing you should pursue when you're having a moment of bliss. That's when you're going to be inspired. That's when source is going to speak to you. It's not going to speak to you 
when you're in fear. That's somebody else speaking to you. And those, that somebody else is actually uh, very often something called archons, which are mind parasites. And that's also a big subject in Cali the Destroyer. I, I think that's bang on. And you know, you said joy. And I remember Dr. David Hawkins, who was one of my, my main teachers for a long time, joy calibrates at 540, which is the same level of unconditional love. Yes. So that is where you are going to hit these expansive fields of consciousness that ultimately just, they, they, they really do change your life because you see your life in your world and your relationship with God or source all very differently. Everything kind of changes and you can't kind of take that back. So I think that's incredibly important. Follow your bliss. And for when people say, well, I, I, I can't follow my bliss. I have to do this and I have to do that. And there's all these things. And, you know, we've definitely constructed a lot of times this rat race that we are in this hamster wheel that we're on. But I think what you're saying too, soul, is that when you are in those states of bliss or, or even just these states of sort of more relaxation and calm within the body, that's ultimately when you are in that heart brain coherent state and you will that's when you want to make decisions about things. And at the same point, you're going to get a certain level of clarity around what's even really important in your life. And then if you can start to baby step, even, you know, if you can't make big leaps right off the bat, but if you start to make more and more decisions from that place and based on what really does feel from a connected place important for you, that is ultimately what's going to keep making more and more transitions in your life so that you can start to move more and more to this type of a field on an ongoing basis. Yeah, I like the baby step concept that, that that's what a lot of people need. Some people just jump off the deep end and that's okay too. But for those people who need to have the baby step approach or feel more comfortable with that, you, you just start by following your bliss for as long as you can, I don't know, once a day or a couple of times a day, just do something that gives you pleasure without thinking about outcomes or anything else. Just do it. Even, even if it's just a few minutes and you can work on expanding that. Notice how you feel in that state versus when you come back out into the mundane or into the fear grid, or, you know, whatever you want to call it. And as you expand that, that blissful feeling of, of, of well, embodied consciousness is what it really is, then you can, you can use that as a fulcrum for creating your experience. And I really think that's, that's one of the places where the law of attraction kind of fell down for me is that it was still a kind of era to epigenetic mind body approach to transformation. So it's like thinking about transformation, but not really transforming. Well, I, I think, like you said, where we're moving now in this era three medicine is everything really needs to be embodied. So to me, it's like when I think about the law of attraction, it's like where, where I find that that's helpful is if I can conjure up something in my imagination, and then if I can embody it so that I genuinely get really feeling that inspired sensation in my body, and then I have to and then what happens ultimately is that then I don't have to do something per se. It's almost like you're just being called to act. It's, it's actually hard not to act when you're genuinely in that place. So I feel like that's where the legs come underneath it. If you can connect to that feeling, but it, it's very much now you need to be embodying. It's not a thinking linear process. Yeah. And it's not anything, you know, where you're, you have to be a saint or act a certain way. One might go into feeling, feeling blissful, and emerge from it or still be in that state and decide to go out and protest against injustice, decide to go out and, and practice civil disobedience and stand up for, for you know, one's own rights and the rights of other people. This could be transformative on so many levels because I think people would feel more empowered and they would see the playing field much more clearly. Yeah, well said. Yeah, and I it, it's definitely acting from that place of authenticity with inside ourselves without necessarily needing permission and also without censoring ourselves from it. I think that's really important. I, I think we need to sort of connect with what honestly feels right inside of us and then live from that place and that, and be open to that changing, whatever that's going to look like down the road, be open to that kind of changing as you have new experiences. But at that moment in time, that's probably the most honest thing you can do is just really act in alignment with where you currently are. 
Oh, in terms of neuroplasticity, it should change over time. Yeah. I think if you're always doing the same thing year after year after year after year, something's not right. Yeah. So where can people learn more about the work you're doing? I, we're going to check out your newest book too, because that sounds like a really fascinating read at the moment and very timely. But where can people learn about all of the stuff that you got going on? Oh, yeah. Well, I've got, you know, I've got three websites. I have a, I have a personal artist slash author's website. That's crowrising.com, crow like the bird, crowrising.com. And then my blog, where I, I, you know, I'm publishing like a serialization of snooze on the blog. I, I pub publish uh, interviews, but also a lot of other content, a lot of stuff on germ theory or the fallacies of germ theory, a lot of stuff having to do with the pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. That's over at snooze to awaken.com. And that's snooze and the number two awaken.com. And then the Regenetics work is at Phoenix, like the bird, Phoenix Regenetics, R-E-G-E-N-E-T-I-C-S dot org. Okay, we're going to make sure we've got all of those links in the show notes there for everybody. And you can go check out all your work. I, I know. So when I started looking at all this stuff, I'm like, man, you've, you've got a lot of different things that you've done. So I had no idea you were an artist until I started checking all your stuff out. I was like, wow, you got... Uh, you, you've tapped into your creativity. So that's that's fascinating. I was following my bliss. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us, Soul. An absolute pleasure. That was a, really a lot of fun.